Hello friends. In this video, I shall be talking to you about a very commonly performed investigation in urology clinics in our day to day practice to make a diagnosis of low urinary tract dysfunction. This test is called urophlometry and in the present video, I will first tell you about why do we do this test. If you want to make a diagnosis of a low unit tract dysfunction and you want to find out what is happening to the contractile force, what is happening to the obstructive passage, you need first step, first test that you need is to document the characteristics of the urinary flow and the test is called Uroflowmetry. Actually speaking, this is a computerized measurement of the urinary flow related characteristics, various characteristics, as I'll tell you shortly. And then it generates an objective printout of the, the flow pattern, the flow rates, flow time, so many things. And you have a printout, the printout can be stored and can be used as a future reference. So it is an objective transformation of subjective symptomatology of the patient. Now you may ask me, when do we perform this test? What are the indications of this test? So we sometimes do this test as a first time screening test, just to find out what is happening to the low urinary tract. This is called screening test or this can be done as a follow-up test. One test has been done, some treatment has been given and you want to repeat the test. So there are two scenarios of using this test. One is for primary diagnosis making and then second time is for follow-up. For a primary diagnosis making, this test is very commonly used for those patients who come with clinically manifest problems of the urinary stream like that. They'll say, my stream is either slow, my stream is thin, or I feel obstructed when I pass urine. They have the clinical symptom. It's a manifest problem, right? So for that, this test is very commonly ordered. But we also do this test for what is called as clinically hidden low urinary tract dysfunction. Now let me explain what I mean by this. In the clinically manifest group, two very common disorders that surface. One is bladder dysfunction and second is outlet obstruction. This is very common. But when we come to clinically hidden category, there are patients who have long-standing diabetes. They have various problems related to diabetes, but they do not make upfront a complaint of low unit tract symptoms. So in them, if you suspect a low urinary tract disorder because of renal failure, because of UTI, or because of palpable bladder, then you, this is not patient, not symptomatic. But this is a hidden low urinary tract dysfunction, which is suspected. So this test is ordered. Then there are patients who come with recurrent low urinary tract infection, both men and women, and also children. And when they come with recurrent urinary infection, you suspect that there may be some outflow obstruction to urinary bladder and to diagnose that hidden bladder outflow obstruction, you do this screening investigation of urophlometry. Then there are patients of persistent overactive bladder who have frequency urgency nocturia, they give them treatment, they do not respond. And then you suspect, is there a bladder outflow obstruction which may be responsible or which may be a causative factor for the overactive bladder and then you order a urophlometry test. And then there are a lot of patients of spinal disease, brain disease, neurological disease, where dominant clinical picture is of neurological disease. But in addition to that, sometimes you suspect ongoing low urinary tract dysfunction and you order a urophlometry test. So I hope you are now clear that when do we use this test as primary diagnosis making tool as a screening modality. 
both in symptomatic patients as well as in asymptomatic patients. The second group on the right side is the follow-up test. And this test is done on those patients who are put on medical therapy for low urinary tract diseases. Common examples are BPH, neurogenic bladder, overactive bladder, or dysfunctional voiding syndromes in children and in females. All these four category patients are treated medically and at frequent intervals, depending upon the institutional practice or your own personal practice, you will like to repeat this test again and again. Then there are patients who undergo surgical treatment on low urinary tract. And to see the outcome of surgical procedure, you do this follow-up test. And common examples here are transurethral resection of prostate, radical prostatectomy, urethroplasty, direct vision internal urethrotomy, bladder reconstruction surgery, or anti-incontinence surgery, the slings, etc., for females and men. So these are four common operations that we do and to see the result of operation. Or if patient is fine initially, in subsequent follow-up, whether the patient is maintaining same level of success or is getting a problem in future, we do this test as follow-up modality. And then you can compare test A to test B and to test C, and you have a documentary evidence in front of you how the disease is progressing. But then friends, as is true with any investigation, you should know when not to perform this test. First of all, there can be patient related issues on account of which you may not like to do this test. Or there may be disease related issues. The disease means urological disease, which is there in the patient. The patient may not be mentally prepared or physically prepared when you have first seen the patient in your OPD practice and you want to do the test. Patient may not be mentally prepared or he may be mentally, physically incapacitated to do the test. So there, please don't order. And secondly, if patient is severely constipated, this test should not be done because the results of the test may be fallacious. In the disease related issues means, if the urinary bladder of the patient is unable to hold sufficient urine, as will be true because of infection, overactivity, stone in the bladder, recent catheterization, so many things. Then doing urophrometry on a small bladder volume is not prudent. Or else your clinical judgment is telling you that it is not safe for the patient to hold urine in urinary bladder and this may happen if he's undergone some surgery on lower urinary tract recently. You want bladder to rest, not to function. And thirdly, you don't order this test if you know that patient has over full bladder, patient is in a state of chronic urinary retention, then he will not be able to give you a reasonably good urophrometry reports. So in these two situations, patient related issues and disease related issues do not order for a urophrometry test. If I were to tell you what are the pros of this test, advantages of this test, firstly, this is a non-invasive test, patient has to just replicate the act of maturation in that laboratory. It is very little time consuming. It is easy to perform for the patient and for you and it is fairly economical. So these are four advantages about this test. That is why this test is so popular and therefore it has become a reasonably reliable basic screening test across the world today. But then you must know the demerits, the cones of this test. And first of all, this is a test which is done in a laboratory, right? So when you ask the patient to move inside a laboratory or inside a washroom or a toilet kind of facility, there's obviously bound to be a performance anxiety. And first time you do this test, there is always a performance anxiety. So keep that in mind. Secondly, when you do this test, there can be patient induced or machine induced errors which can come up in the recording and you have to see them and make a clinical judgment about the interpretation. And often uh, this test needs to be repeated in the same visit because there can be many flaws as just I mentioned. So uh, it is it is in fact advisable that you do the urophrometry test twice 
in the first visit to arrive at a meaningful conclusion so thank you very much i hope you have understood my point that when do we perform this test in our clinical practice so in case you have any questions you can write to me on my email or visit my website the academy of urology thank you very much